Hi and welcome to Steve Wraith's True Crime Podcast and today I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Tony Seals. How are you, Tony? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Steve. You're right, mate. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, good to see you too, mate. You're looking well. And um, of course, we did this interview last year uh, when I'd mm. started out the podcast on uh, on Instagram. But since then, you've, your book's come out, which uh, I've read um, from cover to cover. Uh, the Big Con. Uh, what a book that is, by the way. And I mean, I knew the story. I knew uh, I knew some of the story because uh, obviously we're pals and obviously we got to know each other a couple of years ago. But mm. wow, what a book. I mean, that, that is a roller coaster. A a roller coaster ride, and of course, the subhead in there. How I stole 30 million and got away with it, I think, is certainly going to appeal to the listeners on the show today. Yeah, I mean, something we thought about for ages as well because, um, you know, I was like, oh, I don't really like the title of getting away with it because it's not kind of the message that I want to send to people, yeah, because I didn't get away with it. But, um, I suppose. The catch of it all is, is when you read the book, you know, and you kind of understand the stuff that you do get away with on the way through, which most people that have been involved with crime can kind of relate to. And most people that have been at any level of criminal, they bundle through different types of crimes that they do to get to wherever it is they're going. And kind of that's just what I've done, you know? And uh, so to unravel them for any police officer anywhere in the world would be kind of impossible. I can't even remember half of what happened. So how would anyone else ever prove anything? So. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, look, it's, it's a great story. We're going to touch on a, a lot of the stuff that's in the book today, just so people get a flavour of it. My aim really to get you back home is that people go and buy the book. And honestly, you can get that on, on Amazon. Uh, get yourself down into the description box for the video today. Uh, I've stuck a few links up there. But honestly, all good bookshops and some bad ones as well will sell that book. And I honestly, I, I wouldn't big a book up if I didn't believe in it. And this book is brilliant. So get out there and, and buy it and uh, or download loan it however you like to read your books because honestly this is one you'll not be able to put down it's a page to page turner and it's uh it's well worth well worth a read um just just a little bit of really background on you tony just for the listeners mm. where, where were you brought up mate uh so i was born in a place called greenwich in south london uh and so i grew up around the streets of greenwich and woolwich and deptford and kind of pretty much most parts of South London I would venture into in the end, really. So, uh, yeah, that's where I come from. Happy childhood? Uh, yeah, pretty happy. Um, I mean, you know, I had stuff happen to me as a child that, you know, creates problems that play out as an adult, for sure. I was sexually abused um, at a young age. I was bullied uh, continuously. Um, right up until probably when I was about 14 and then by the time you get to 14 I've had enough I'm becoming a man and you know I'm earning a bit of money here there and everywhere and uh, I suppose it just I've just yeah I just become a man mate and that was it I was standing up for myself there was no I bought I got a baseball bat I bought myself a baseball bat and um, that was it uh, I weren't going to take no rubbish from no one no more and uh, and I didn't it was your stepdad, really, wasn't it? There was a, a root cause of, of, of a lot of your issues. Yeah, I think my stepdad um, was violent towards my mum. So seeing a lot of domestic violence, kind of, you know, it just, you're around it. Like, you see stuff that's not right, and I'm, you shouldn't be seeing that stuff. I mean, I've learned now that it causes a lot of problems when, when, a, when a parent leaves a child, you know, between the years of zero to five, like, there's some mad statistic like 48 percent you're 48 percent more likely uh to gain an addiction yeah like addiction leads to criminal behavior criminal behavior leads to prison um so you can see like what happens from when childhood you know trauma takes you something happens to you as a child it's just a, a natural thing to uh end up in crime uh, a lot of people you know argue constantly with people all the time that say um oh, it's just an excuse well it's not an excuse because it's stuff that happened you know when we made what makes a murderer for channel four we interviewed like over the course of the, the, to get murderers on we interviewed like 300 different people that are committing murder and every single one of them had childhood trauma like i mean it's not a it's a really serious thing. So, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, then that's what I tried to do in the book is try and tell it 
from that way round. So you can kind of see, I don't want to be little Tony. I don't want to be that person anymore. I just want to change my identity. And you can see that play out as I get older. Yeah, I mean, um, the trauma side of things is something which seems to become more apparent in a lot of these podcasts that you see, you know, done on a on a week to week basis with former former criminals and Freddie Foreman, um, you know, somebody who you and I both know well. Um, you know, when we did his documentary, Fred spoke, you know, specifically about the trauma of seeing dead bodies in war torn bombed London. You know. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I I say it all the time. We. We've been, we had two wars more or less back to back in this country um, that the generations before us would have had masses of trauma because the men go off and fight war, the women have kids, the kids, everyone's struggling, the food's low, the rationing's low, like everyone's hungry. So how do you get around that if you're from a, you know, a working class family? And that's predominantly where crime happens. You know, and that's what I said in the book. That was a point that I made that's really important that, you know, if you've got money or you're given the, the education the, and understanding of the education that's needed, yeah, because I was a kid that was given the opportunity to get education, but I'm wayward, I'm disruptive because I don't actually understand. They're trying to give me the same information as what they're giving these other kids who's got their middle class or upper class mum and dad at home, yeah, giving them the understanding of the information that they're getting. I never got the understanding of the information. Yeah. I, I'm not understanding that process of the information. So like, I might be getting it, but I'm not processing it through my mind. So um, that, you know, I think nowadays that, that they get this kind of stuff now, plus you add into the mix, I had ADHD, all these other things, my mum. So you were saying about my mum, she was a drinker. Um, I'm living with my, my grandmother my dad's left like there's a whole set of circumstances that lead you down that road and it's lovely to see all the others talking about trauma now um and talking about all of that kind of stuff because it's so important and that's how we we get better a lot of the people that are, are criminals just end up in that criminal way you know people say there's no honor amongst thieves but you know i know plenty of thieves with a lot of honor so that's not actually true yeah, in the book you talk a lot of, uh, you know, of being bullied. And I mean, again, that it, it's an awful thing. Kids can be cruel, can't they, at school in particular? And, mm -hmm. you know, being labelled as a, as, as a tramp. I mean, I, I can, I can you know, basically, you know, go back to my school days and probably I got pushed into private school because I was a couple of years behind. And, and I remember being called a tramp myself. And it's those kind of things stick. It gives you a bit of stigma. But it's, I suppose if you're a certain character like you are, and certainly, like I've been, I, I don't know. It, it, would you say it's character building as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've kind of over the years, I've had loads of discussions with like doctors and professors and psychologists, and they all say, you know, all the stuff that's happened to you, that's what makes you who you are today. That's why you can see an opportunity quicker than most people. You can take that opportunity. You've got drive. You've got you know, no matter where you get, no matter what you do, I'm always the same, Steve. I never, ever change. I still wear the same clothes now as the day you met me, mate. Yeah, nothing yeah, yeah. ever changed. And it never will because that's just the way I am. I'm, I'm me. I don't like that. I've always been like this. You know, I was saying to someone a couple of days ago that I worked at the clothes show when I was 18 and I still wore a roll neck, black, black skinny jeans and a pair of black boots. That was just me. Like, I've always been that way. So um, I tried to change the outcome of where I was going and not just for me, for others, I suppose. Um, and uh, I probably fouled a bit in that when I was criminally doing it. Um, so now while I'm not criminally doing it, I try to make that up and do as much as I can now to try and help others like, like me, mate, like them tramps and ones that grow up without things that don't have the smart trainers that, you know, end up stealing to get the smart trainers because they're getting bullied at school, you know, People just don't become criminals. They don't. You're not born criminal. It doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a born gangster. It doesn't happen. Yeah, you could be born into criminal families, 100%, and your then your social environment is going to mould you to become a criminal. But you wasn't born that way. I know plenty of people whose dads are badasses, but they're pussies. Like there's loads of them, you know. So. It's just your environment that molds you. you. Get yeah, you can be born different, but no, 
certain elements around you are going to mold you differently. And the society is set up that way. Yeah, so you don't get check changing shops and cash converters and shops like this, low grade stores, yeah, that, that do low grade trade. They come in our areas, mate, where we come from, because it's us that are selling our goods to get the next thing to, and only to buy the crap that them people are selling us anyway, um, to try and keep up with all the Joneses, because that's what we believe it's all about, you know? When did you first get involved in crime, Tony? What was your first your, your first bit of action, if you like? Um, I mean, I was I was seven. Um, I was just a skinny little kid, and uh, the the big boys, my uncle and his mates, were kind of hanging about at a pub that was at the top of the road from where I lived. And uh, yeah, look, that's me. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, funny. Um, and. They needed to just drop me in through the hatch at the top, you know, like on the roof, yeah? And um, they just literally just got me down on a rope and got me to open up the door and then they went in and just robbed the pub. And so that was my kind of first brush along with, you know, just little bits of shoplifting here and there. Uh, but I'd never really got involved in crime in any other way, but it just becomes a lifestyle, doesn't it? And then before you know it, I'm fighting for, like they used to, all the big boys used to get round and I was fighting in a in a ring, and my, un my own uncle gave me a bottle to hit the kid round the head with. Like, you know, this is an environment that's being made for you. You know, the social environment for me is now coming to that, and of course, violence then becomes part of that. And I'm growing up. It's wild, isn't it? Like, for real, for real children. Like, and everyone where I come from will know that I was a horrible little kid. Like, I was. I was horrible. Can't you look angelic in that photo? I mean, were you were you nervous? Were, were you excited when you went on that first job? I didn't even think about it, mate. Wow. There was no, there was no like, there's no. It's a different. It's a really different type of. I've just actually, I've just, we've just done a study for it, right? I've just had a researcher follow me. Um, why I do what I do nowadays, yeah, which is getting paid to break into banks to show them how people break into them and do the bits that, that happen nowadays, right? Um, and they said that it's like watching a predator stalk its prey because the like your whole movement, everything that you do, like, and when you then, well, like, I've never looked at crime like that, but then I started. <laughs> You know, most criminals can spot other criminals in all types of different environments, right? That's just how it, it works. So I, I started walking down the road in Liverpool and I could spot the movements of these other criminals and then work out the difference within crimes of the area of what actually goes on, yeah? So you can see, oh, look, mostly predominantly drugs, yeah? Like the drug trade leads to much lower down crime. So stealing a car's... Um, burglary, yeah, the high level crime is not so prominent, yeah, because it's not as needed. Because the people with who who are successful at crime are the higher level up in the chain and of course spend more money. So, like, it's quite it's quite weird to see it when you look at it in that way and see how society molds everything that we do. And it's all their game. And people can say you're grass, you're this, you're that, whatever. That's you're playing their game. I'm not. I'm playing my game. I'm not playing no one else's game. Yeah, you're an idiot if you're playing their games. You play their games. That's up to you. Yeah, but the way that th this works is I get paid to do now is protecting companies, right? It's kind of like what a lot of people try to do in the other world. Yeah, but just never figure out successfully how to make that legal. Yeah, but now we live in an age where computers are king, right? And in the olden days, you had, in the West, in the Wild West, right, you had people like me that would become sheriffs, right, and they would be give, they would be pardoned for all the things that they'd done, all the horrible stuff that they'd done to tidy up all the other stuff around because you can't, if you send a sheep to talk to a wolf, what happens? Wolves can't talk to sheep, mate. It doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah? true. Like, it don't happen. Yeah, they get eaten. Yeah, you have to send other wolves to talk to other wolves and make them understand. Because it's not like a lot of them don't understand the violence that then ends up at coming out the back of it and how that then all keeps impacting on all of us, Steve. No matter where you live, it impacts on every single one of us, mate, on a daily basis, yeah? 
and the problem's only getting worse. You know, and how long is it before now it boils over and you can't control it? Like, you can't get a, a lid on it. Like, what's everyone going to do then? Yeah, 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 good point. We'll talk about what you're doing now uh, just before we finish uh, today. But first, first arrest. Uh, oh, God, first arrest. How old was I? Uh, I was really young. Um, the police in my area, they were just on me from a kid. They were just like, they just... <laughs> They were different back then. They were, they were, you know, they, they kind of, they looked at kids differently. Like they knew that, I suppose they thought I would go into a bank robbery, arm robbing, yeah? Because they'd come up and just say stupid things. Where are you going? Blag a shotgun or stupid things. Like from a, a police constable, I'm a 12 year old kid. They're saying this stuff, yeah? Like it just seems like a really weird thing to say. But I suppose when they're looking at the generations that's come up before me, it's all armed robbery and it's all that kind of stuff. And it was their job then to know the little scallywags that were up and coming around. Um, it's changed now, isn't it? Mm. It's like a, it's, there's so much of it going on everywhere and everyone wants to succeed. You know what I mean? Everyone wants that to get up there and try and be something. No one wants to, no one ain't committing crime to stay in the crime world, are they? They're all trying to commit crime to get out of it. You know? Yeah. Did you go? Did you go to young offenders, or were you? Were you? Was your first time behind bars in prison? Yeah, first time behind bars was in prison. For um, I uh, I got into a, you know, I was doing that young dumb full of cum thing, um, and went out. Was kind of coming up the ranks a bit, from the man of getting a bit of money, like thinking I'm Jack the Lad, and um, I ended up going to a nightclub in Essex. And the doorman gave me a slap. And uh, that just caused a chain reaction. I just come out. like I had a, I had a 2-2 blank firing pistol in my um, glove box uh, that was meant to have been reacted, uh, reactivated. And um, just kind of, just it was just a stupid thing to do. I just got the gun, walked up, was drunk, drunk a bottle of drink, geezer slapped me and then that was it I just went ballistic and um, it was stupid got caught there and then and uh, that was it mate and, uh, nicked they let me go the next day I had to go back I was still thinking like, ah, it's going to be nothing because it's just a, the gun's moody it's a nothing thing and um, that was it how I'm long done. did you get? I got 15 months for that So, but it was before all the gun laws come in see so, um, like, I think it was it was shortly after that, because it was me and another guy that we uh, I went away with. He got he he got two years of shooting a copper with a pellet gun, and um, and I've got the fifteen months. So they done me for possession of an imitation firearm with intent to harm, because I um because I went mad at, at, at the guy. I mean, it, it's horrible, stupid, just a really stupid stupid thing to do because I just would like you know I wanted to be someone basically and that kind of took it out of me at that moment though like it kind of took it I didn't want to go to that level the anger still in me I got all that anger boiling up it's still inside me but like I've released it for the first time it's come out the rage has just you know been let go so uh yeah that was it which prisons did he go to and what was that what was that first night in 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 a cell like that was horrible. First night in the cell was horrible. Like I, I've heard loads of people say it on here now, which is really good. But um, you know, when the door shuts, you know, that that if you've never been to jail before, the first time that the, not in a in a police station cell in a proper prison when you're in the prison, I didn't know nothing about what what was what. You know, I was on the I was on the wing for a week here, yeah, and I kept hearing this noise. Uh, all over, and like all of a sudden, everyone go out on the yard, and I thought, what's that? And then one day, the screw come down to the end. And uh, I had lights on for exercise. And uh, I was like, ah, that's why they all keep going out on the yard. Um, so that was quite uh, funny. But yeah, I mean, that sentence was not bad. It was, um, I had a bit of a madness because I got caught with a skipping rope in there. Um, and so they thought I was trying to escape because I was having it with a few naughty people in there. <laughs> and so uh, I was just mad. And then they shipped me out. I got moved to Brixton. And then in Brixton... I got I got to work in the officer's mess after sitting down. I wrote a seven-page letter to the prison's ombudsman, yeah, to explain why I wouldn't try to escape. Why on earth would I? My missus at the t my missus was pregnant at the time with my son, yeah. Like 
Why on earth would I try and escape? I'm getting out for his birth. Why on earth would I want to get try and to do what? But I suppose they're not looking at it from that perspective. You know, they're looking at people that normally just do desperate things. And um, yeah, I mean, some funny incidents in jail. I won't spoil it for anyone that's going to read the book because, as you know, there's some brilliant ones. I've, I've got it. I've got to mention. I mean, you always want for the hustle, Tony. Back in those days, is it true you were selling your own piss? Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> And what was the purpose Cause, of that? Because in jail, yeah, I don't do nothing. Like, I'm not a drug taker, yeah? Like, I'm perfect. So I'm going to, like, I want little bits and pieces, don't I? Like, and you work with people that are working with you in the kitchens, but they might be getting the cheese or the coffee out or the, you know, these people become important parts of your network when you're surviving behind the door, right? Um, so they need they're taking drugs yeah when you work in a in a good anyone who's worked in a, in a good job in prison knows you get regularly tested you know like they'll test you because they have to they want to well because that's a high churning job everyone wants it um so they want the right person in that role because it's trusted so they um yeah they test and uh why wouldn't people sell it so they used to put it in the bags you know like the little sound they give you like the breakfast pack bags yeah yeah so he's just pissing the breakfast back bags and then they'll just tie it round their bollocks and just tie it round. And then when they go in, they just get their thing out and then stand there as if they're going to have a wee and just have, just pierce the end <laughs> and just hold it as if they're having a wee. And uh, yeah, that was it. But, uh, Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant story, that. Brilliant story. Um, Obviously, you come out uh, from, from that sentence. I mean... Was the part of you the thought, right? I'm going to stay on the on the the straight and narrow, or were those contacts, the networking that you had inside, did it give you a few ideas of what you wanted to do? Because you you moved on to ID fraud, which which you describe in the book as, as a victimless crime um, at, at the start. But I suppose your journey makes you realise that it's clearly not. But yeah, tell us a little bit about your your progression up that criminal ladder and and to the scale where you were making lots of money. Yeah, I definitely never said it's a victimless crime. Um, okay. But, um, so, so yeah, I mean, it starts, I come out of that sentence, I want to, um, I want to go just be normal, you know, my missus has had, you know, she's had my kid, I come out, she has the kid like a couple of weeks later, he's born, um, and then I'm on tag, yeah, so because of the, one of the skipping rope incident, yeah, I lost like a month's loss of remission, so I was on tag, um so i had to wait for the tag to come off then got a car went cabin mini cabin <laughs> at the cab office where my dad was at and then uh just like i just saved i was just like caning it caning it caning it because i wanted to go away on a holiday like i hadn't been away for a while and i wanted to just break get my head around what was going to happen and um I, I, it must have been about nine o'clock one night and his sort he rings me and says he wants to come see me. So um, we was just sitting there chatting and he's like, look, oh, we can do this. And uh, that was it. From that point on, like I met another guy that was kind of living around there and that kind of at the same time all come together nicely. I've done a move with this Moroccan guy and... Um, we caned it like we we got like quite a few quid and that just sent me back on my criminal way and uh, at the same time everything then sparked back up with salty and then we just kind of moved into the id theft thing in a big way um just just going along just doing loads of different things you know but mainly like my bread and butter was always tvs because uh you know, I, I said it in the book, I think, mate, that you, 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 you might think it's small time, but if you're getting 10 a day, you do the maths. Back then, they're three grand each. Yeah? Yeah. Like, tell me one bank robber that's getting 30 grand a day. I don't know any of them, mate. They yeah. just do big jobs every now and again. Consistent. Consistent. Yeah, and that was like, so you're, and then you get a lot, you kind of pull back, and then before you know it, I'm mixing around other groups of people and other stuff starts to happen so i just totally immerse myself back in that criminal world yeah i mean that story about the 890 grand yacht 
Um, oh. Wow. I mean, that that is certainly... I learned a lot from the book. I mean, I knew I knew you'd, you know, a lot of your story, but some of the stuff was just incredible. How, I mean, would you mind sharing how you managed to do that? Yeah, it's really easy. So um, we'd been down to... Uh, we'd been down there partying, right? And uh, we'd noticed that this, this yacht place was down there. And uh, so we went back down a few weeks later... I've kind of thought that uh, me and Salty always had this thing of like, he would always egg me on to do stuff. Yeah. Like he would, he would just like, we've just done it ever since we was kids. He would just always do it. And, um, he kind of then egged me on and I ended up going into this, uh, this yacht showroom. Like, so it's just, like, imagine this, it was just, it's like a round building. Yeah. And uh, it's like an estate agent. You know, they've got them little plaques that hang down in the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got like all pictures of boats just like on, like all just going round. So um, I was like, oh, well, that one looks good. That one, like, you know, that looks pretty cool, that one. Um, let's go in. So I go in, I initiate a conversation anyway. So they, um, they do finance. So at this time, we're like, I figured out the finance system properly. Yeah, I know how to make driving licenses. I know how to make all the bits and pieces that you need to get something, obtain something uh, on credit or finance. Um, so of course I I, so I want to go for the boat. So uh, of which I did, and um, I kind of go away. I'm I'm messing about. I don't want to spoil it for the people that will buy yeah. the book. Yeah. So uh, I kind of go in, go out, come and come away, and. Um, I'm sitting there waiting for it to go through and I can just see this blue light. It's just coming down, like down this hill, just coming down. And I thought, my ass is going 10 to the dozen now. Yeah, and I'm just sitting there thinking, I wonder if they're for me. Like, I think they're just for me. And uh, as I come down, that was it. I was just uh, up. I got out. I had a big motor. I get in the motor and I just come out. And as I come out, they're coming in. And I was off. But um, yeah, I... I it was all just, it's all just digital, Steve. It doesn't matter about the amount. Yeah, the amount doesn't matter. Um, but you kind of like they it changed. Like as we got more notorious at doing what we've done, yeah, you could see how the institutions behind all the lending started to change their approach. You know, because up until that point, there wasn't really no security features in the background to prevent people like me. So in the, in the early days, you could go and hit a company for three days with the same profile and they wouldn't know about it for three days. So every, if, as long as I knew, yeah, they all use GE Capital. Yeah. Wow. Look, bang and hit just every single one that does GE Capital. So at that time, it might have been Curry's Comet all the like, electrical retailers and I can use the same, once one's gone through, I know it's going to give me the amount of money that I want. I can hit that for three days constantly with all them stores that do that same one. And they won't pick it up for three days until, until the paperwork came in. But of course then computers came, it all started to get more and more sharper. Cause in the early days, they used to have to phone the applications through. Um, but as it got on, now they fill them out on the, uh, App, computer applications and now of course it's all live online get your video up plonk your face there and do it do all that kind of stuff but um you know it's massively needed considering how many people are out there trying to steal information on a daily basis yeah towards the end of the book i, I mean you know like every man you have a good woman behind you and you had you got a, a really nice family as well but your wife didn't really know what on earth you did didn't you mm. what you got up to i mean that in itself you know is is it's more pressure on you you've got to keep that secret it's like having a second life isn't it how did you manage to do that and cope with that pressure um i suppose i've always lived a double life i suppose my whole life i've kind of always tried to be someone else so it's comfort zoning you get you know you're in the comfort zone I, I, I don't know it's something weird like when you first when I first went on the run yeah so I've been on I was spent six years on the run right so the first day I went on the run I was quite like oh what if what if they see me what if they see me and then I kind of went into this not caring anymore and then mm -hmm. became another character that had to just keep everything cool, you know? Because if I, I can't tell her. 
Yeah. I can't, like, I can't tell her because, you know, she thinks we're living in the perfect zone, don't she? Like, and now everything's just about to go down the pan. Um, it's all just coming to a head. The pressure was massive, uh, like hugely massive. And something I probably, at the time, I'm not going to lie, I never even thought about it, yeah, of, of the pressure. I could feel it. Like, obviously, I could feel, like, kind of, I could feel the intenseness of the pressure, of the stuff, the situation, of everything around me. But I didn't really see it. One of my mates did. He said to me once, um, you're going to have a breakdown, you, if you carry on. and Because uh, he could obviously see all the strains of everything. Like, and all in the background, things were starting to break away and break up. So, um, yeah. But, you took, yeah, you took right. your teeth. You took your teeth out as well, didn't you? you took. I mean, I, again, I didn't know that, but I, that's paranoia, I suppose, with, with some pliers. I mean, again, it's maybe it's just wor- you know, in case you got caught, they might be able to identify you from your from your teeth. Yeah, I think that I, I wasn't. That's. I mean, you know, that wasn't really what I was saying in there as much. Yeah, and I think that when the guy, so the book I had ghostwritten in the beginning, yeah, to just yeah. get us a script, and um, that was something that we left in just as a, as a more of a, you know, kind of thing that happened. But the real reason I took the teeth out is because it was bloody painful, yeah? And I didn't want to... <laughs> it, it, it's annoying to keep going to dentists as my brother. It's ruining his identity, yeah? yeah? <laughs> like, and I'm kind of having half a moral conscience about that stuff at the same time as well. <laughs> um, so, like, it's not fair on him. And, and, like, the pain's horrible. And, like, the thing is with pain, yeah? Once you get out, it's gone, on it? Yeah. It's gone. No, it's just gone. So that that's that was that's was my method, and uh, that was exactly why I done it. So, I'll stick. Um, to, I'll stick to the dentist, Tony. I think um, <laughs> you clearly love the good life. What was the biggest attraction for you? Then was it the hustle, or was it the ill-gotten gains, or a bit of both? Um, it was never the money. It's never ever been about money. You know, like it, it's just not because money just brings other problems. Mm-hmm. And, like, and you know brings other people into your life that perhaps you wouldn't have had if you didn't have it as well um, and sometimes you don't want them people um, but yeah I, I don't know Steve I suppose it's, it's a real strange one because I've had better things happen since I've been straight and doing all the the straight stuff than I ever have you know I feel much better about me now like mm-hmm. I feel, you know, the other stuff, when I, when anything I'd done before was always trying to hide or cover things up. Like it was, it was never for an enjoyable purpose, you know, like it was just to cover it up. Like it's, it's really different. Like when you go and do something now, cause I'm going, cause I want to enjoy it. Yeah. Cause like when you've got all them ill gotten gains or you've got, you're on the run or you've, you've, you know, you've done something dodgy to get there, you're constantly doing that. Like, and if you ain't, you're an idiot. Because if you think they're not looking at you at any point, you could be looking at any of us at any point, and you just don't know that. And so I was always conscious of that. I always wanted to keep that in my mind. And I like when I was criminally active, I would keep that in my mind at the forefront of my brain. You know, no one, small handful of people knew where I lived. Uh, um I wouldn't drive the same car. I wouldn't drive all the time. I wouldn't. I, I'd, you move differently. You move like totally different. What was the turning point for you, Tony? Um, so there was a few things. I mean, it, you know, there was a, a a couple of things that triggered it along the way. There was on that arrest. Um, when I get caught eventually in Sheffield, um, the arresting officer, we get bowed, we go back six weeks later, she throws us in the cells and um, she must leave us there for about an hour and then she comes down and she's like, ah, oh, I hope you're really proud of yourself. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, um, I've got a young lady upstairs who's, uh, whose dad's dead, yeah? And I said, uh, yeah? She said, well, that's the identity that you stole. So now, like, We've got a dead dad involved. I've never really seen a victim. Now I've got a woman upstairs devastated because we've used someone's identity like that. It was kind of like a real eye-opener. So I felt totally deflated, Steve. I felt sick, winded, the whole lot, which I should have done, and I do, yeah? Um, so that was one part of it. And then 
after, you know, I jump bow, I go on the run, I'm still being selfish, I'm still just thinking of me. I don't even think about that again, yeah? I then, um, Lynn comes to see me. Uh, she hasn't seen me for ages, just, you know, after the arrest. You know, what can I tell her? I've been on the run for six years. She don't know about it. And, oh, yeah, everything's just all bullshit. Um, so when she finally calms down, uh, she comes to see me on the visit. And uh, I sit in there. I've got, like, um, my vest on. I was in uh, Doncaster prison. And um, I'm waiting. And uh, I see her come in. And she's got my son, Zach, holding, it, holding his hand. And he's just crying. Like, I can just see him crying. And uh, she, when she gets over, I say, like, what's up with him? Like, why is he crying like that? Thinking, like, what's going on? There's something going on outside. Like, and she says, um, why do you think he's crying, you idiot? Like, his dad's in here, in jail, and now he's got to come all the way up north to come and see his dad who's in prison that was his hero. Like, and I kind of just was like, whoa. And... I just, at that point, like any father, any man who, you know, it's your kid, isn't it? I, the kid didn't ask to be brought here. It's my kid. I brought him here. I chose that I was going to be a man and take care of my my child. Um, and I, I didn't feel that I was doing that in the right way. So, um, as to be a role model, you know, um, for your children, what I was displaying was not a role model. That's not a good message from my kids. Yeah, so I had to change what I was doing. I had to change how that was going to happen, which, you know, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, the people that are out, just coming out just now, yeah, I've done this 10 years ago when no one was doing it, right? So coming out with it all back then and approaching the government, I actually went to the government first, <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, in jail, I went back to the wing. One of the guys in jail was a lord, yeah, and he knew some people um, in the government. In these, like, in in the D category jails, yeah, you get all different types of people in there, yeah. So he, he'd been in there for a bit of money laundering. So, but he had some connections to the home office. He's dead now, God rest his soul, yeah. But um, he um, he got me a connection in there, and so. What I done, I made a Moody passport, yeah, and um, I went into the Home Office with a Moody passport, right? Um, beat all their systems. <laughs> um, I get to the guy, the head of fraud for the for the UK government at the time, and uh, I just I was arrogant, I was stupid, like I'm I, I'm living in a film at that moment. I'm kind of being a right idiot, yeah, and uh, wasn't really thinking right, and just threw the passport on the table and went oh your system's a bit rubbish in here <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I sh shouldn't have done that I know it's funny yeah and it is a funny scenario and we can laugh about it now but at the time he weren't laughing yeah, yeah. He, he was kind of sitting there he couldn't even talk to the guy he was just like fuming you could see the steam coming out of his ears and um he just told me that there wasn't an issue with fraud <laughs> and uh and they just shooed me away and tried to shut me down so I I had a long road ahead uh, of trying to get, because it's really like the world I work in now, mate, yeah, like for the fraud side of things, yeah, is totally dominated by police, ex-police officers or ex-military officers or ex-security something, yeah, it's really, really dominated by that. And so they have a, they don't just trust anyone, you know, they don't just allow anyone to come into their circle. You have to prove yourself for a long time. And it took me a long, long time to get that credibility, to prove myself, to make sure that I can do that, you know, and that, that that's what we do now. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that that is what you do now. You turned your life around, um, you know, 10 years now since you walked away from, you know, the, the stuff that's covered in the big con book. And and you've become really successful, you know, not only is your, your expertise in preventing crime uh, become much sought after, you, you go out and speak, you're producing TV shows now and, and, and you've written a, a best-selling book and, and now there's going to be a dramatisation of your life on, on TV as well. I mean, it doesn't get much better, does it? No, I mean, it, you know, like, yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Um, it? Yeah, 
it's it like so all that kind of stuff the book all the tv stuff all of that kind of stuff i, I i'm you know the the messaging from that is what's really important because sometimes it can be skewed you know like you can people get it twisted they think it's all about the best tracksuit that you've got and you know it ain't about that like but we need to get to a level playing field where us further down the pecking order in the lower classes yeah don't feel oppressed by those above us yeah or don't and definitely should never be ridiculed about certain aspects of that person's life um because we we all deserve a fair shot right at life you know we all do de- when there's no no one's born with no rule book yeah like, and everything else here is like rules that we abide by yeah that we stick by a society that was agreed for us by ancestors that we don't even know yeah so you know who's the fool the fool or the fool follows the fool sometimes you have to be change things yeah like, and you have to change the way that we're thinking change people's thought processes like you know it's it's real stuff last two questions tony uh first of all what would you say to a young tony sales thinking about embarking on a life of crime just don't do it just believe in yourself yeah and go and go and try and find an industry that you enjoy and feel confident about trying to find out everything that you possibly can about that industry yeah like i struggled for a long time being me like when you talk at some of the levels that I've spoken at in the past with some of, you know, world leaders in the room at, rooms at times, yeah? Like, when you're talking and telling them about scenarios of how stuff can happen, yeah, I've been confident, I learned confidence to say what's on my mind in that way um, and not feel, just because I might not pronounce a word right, yeah, a bit like Del Boy, but not too much like Del Boy, because that even that's just a piss take of people from our world, yeah? Yeah. Like, a, a lot, because I don't view that as whatever. Yeah, because we have to look at this for what it properly is. Enough's enough. Yeah, like, so, you know, that's, that's what I'm all about, mate. Last question. The pandemic, of course, has caused a major rise in cybercrime. Have you got any tips for people at home on how to protect themselves? <laughs> don't go online. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, let me think. Let me give you some good tips. Let VPN you... seems to be all the rage. There seems to be everyone seems to be flogging VPN at the minute. I mean, I'm is sure, that any I'm, is that sure any good? <clears throat> no. So both uh, VPN and HTTPS have both been crapped. You can Google it and read it. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details because most people wouldn't understand how it all works. Um, but you know, it's very important. You should definitely use a VPN. Um, make sure you get a good one, though. High brand companies are normally the best, reputable. But if you're getting, uh, always remember that nothing on the internet is free. If it's free, you're the product. Um, you know, that's a really important one because people go, oh, I can download it for free. I've got it for free. No, you didn't download it for free. Your information <laughs> is actually worth something. Um, like, so a lot of people have probably seen. Uh, when you go on a website now, yeah, uh, I, I mean, it still happens to me loads because I don't accept them, yeah, is cookies. So you go onto a new website because of the GDPR laws that were brought in. Um, cookies is kind of like a clever malware. It understands you, yeah. Um, so I would say go and understand what cookies are, yeah, because they're like, kind of like people whispering in your ear. Steve, buy Adidas. Steve, buy Nike. Yeah, like, or Steve, vote for this one. Or, yeah, go kill this one. Like, it's all the same stuff, yeah? Like, this is real stuff, and it's taking place, yeah, right now. Um, So go and understand what that stuff is. Otherwise, don't play on the internet, because you're dealing in something you don't understand. Yeah, like, what is the internet? What is Mm it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like... You know, most people don't even know the basic questions, like, and that, that, you should go and find out where it is. Why is it here? Yeah? Like, why is it just here? Huh? Right. 
the chemistry between me and Tony is genuine, by the way. We've had some proper deep discussions on nights out, and to be fair, like it's uh, honestly, it's an eye opener. I'm not going to say it anymore because you need to go and buy the book, The Big Con by Tony Sales, uh, how I stole thirty million and got away with it. It's a lot more than that, by the way. It's uh, it's an education in itself. And um, Tony lived a life; he's still living a life, and uh, he's doing really, really well for himself now. And um, you know, I'm I'm proud to call him my mate. So, uh, Tony, honestly, thanks for giving up your time today. Best of luck with the book. And a uh, big shout out to our sponsors who are, ironically, a VPN company, Spider VPN, um, <laughs> definitely reputable. Uh, we've also got uh, a big shout out to uh, Jordy Riffs, uh, the makers of guitars, uh, premium guitar lessons for beginners and children, guitar repairs and service and recording studio. Give them a follow on Instagram at Jordy Riffs. And also a big shout out to qtechshop.co.uk, makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls End in Newcastle and Jab Signature, uh, repping the brand today. Um, big shout out to them. They've got the new uh, summer wear coming out very, very soon. New visitor to the channel, subscribe. Hit the subscribe button down in the bottom right-hand corner. Hit the like button. It does help us and share as well. And uh, if you want to make a comment, leave it down below. We're also on podcasts, iTunes and Spotify and all your other decent podcasts cast providers uh, Tony been an absolute pleasure mate uh, good luck Thanks, good, good luck with the book and I'll see you very soon mate take care thanks mate thanks cheers mate top man, man.